Welcome to NASA EDGE. An inside and outside look at all things NASA. We're here in the hangar at Vandenberg Space Force Base to talk about the tower rollback for NOAA's Joint Polar Satellite System's second launch, JPSS-2, a very important mission for NOAA in partnership with NASA. Now, JPSS-2 also marks the 100th mission in LSP's history. And I don't know if you can tell, but I have one of these commemorative 100th mission shirts on. And nice. we'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. Uh, but over the course of the show, we'll talk about history in addition to pulling out a couple of old school commercials from the LSP video archives. And wait, there's more. <laughs> if not only that, we're going to talk about a very important technology demonstration mission for NASA, Loftic. And a good friend of ours, Kristen Domadeo from NASA Langley Research Center, is going to help with those interviews after tower rollback. So before I head on out to the pad with Mick Waltman from LSP to talk more about rollback, uh, you know what they say, you don't know where you're going until you know where you've been. Let's take a look at LSP's history. And lift off. You never forget your first. And my first mission at work was the demonstration of autonomous rendezvous technology. Basically, it was demonstrating the technology of autonomously docking to a spacecraft in space. At the time, I didn't really understand or know what that technology was being used for, but now that technology is being heavily used today. My first assignment was Lucy as a backup integration engineer. I felt overwhelmed at first, but I started to realize I had the full support of my management team. I had all of their years of experience that I could count on as sort of standing behind me. We hit our mark. We launched on the first second of our planetary window that we've been targeting for over three years. Sojourner was my very first. Ever since that mission, I've been a part of every other rover that has landed on Mars. Spirit and opportunity. I was also the launch director for MSL and Curiosity. So those are always something that I could look back and say, wow, I was fortunate enough to be in the right job to be able to do this and do my little part to, to make that happen. After experiencing my very first LSP mission, I think is when reality hit me that I get to be a part of this incredible team that's making history really, and is helping all of humanity, which is amazing. Imagine watching every LSP launch, ever. Zero and liftoff. From the moment of liftoff to spaceship separation, all the way to booster recovery. With this once in a lifetime collection, you can now own every heart stopping moment of LSP's greatest hits. Introducing NASA Edge's ultimate LSP video collection with missions like Icon, TESS, and even Parker Solar Pro. We see you, son. Own this two volume VHS bundle for just $19.98. You'll get 64 hours of blast off after blast off for less than the price of an 18 minute long distance call to Micronesia on off peak hours. But wait, use your credit card and we'll include this limited edition LSP t-shirt for absolutely free. Include an extra $22 for shipping. The Ultimate Launch Service Program VHS will not be sold in stores. Operators are standing by. Call 1-555-800-1LSP to order the Ultimate LSP Collection on two timeless VHS tapes for $19.98. Use your credit card and get the one-size-fits-all medium LSP t-shirt absolutely free. Launch coverage commentary only available in a Midwestern English dialect. Why wait? Order now. We are very excited to have with us today Tim Walsh from the JPSS program, program director, correct? Correct, thank you so much, Blair. It's great to have you it's on the show. It's great to be here. And I, I wanna talk first, um, we're celebrating LSP's 100th mission. How does it feel to be part 
of their legacy. 100 missions is a tremendous legacy and they're failure free. And so uh, JPSS, this is our first mission on an atlas and we're thrilled to be the 100th. It, it really is yeah. kind of a cool thing to be part of. For it really sure. is. It really now, is. I, I do want to talk about JPSS broadly first. We're all excited about the launch and the rollback, but let's talk about the system as a whole. It, what is JPSS? JPSS, the actual, the last S in JPSS, it's Joint Polar Satellite System. So we are in fact a series of five satellites. There was a predecessor satellite called the SNPP, and then JPSS one, two, three, and four. So we are the third of five in the system. A little bonus uh, satellite it is, there. It is a bonus. <laughs> that first one is a precursor and it, re it worked out remarkably well. Well, I want to talk about that for a second. So when you started, you didn't maybe necessarily know that it would develop into this full system. System, you, you kind of had to prove yourself. We did. We were using four really, truly cutting edge instruments on SNPP. And, and then those instruments now are used in, S, in JPSS-1, which is now called NOAA-20 on orbit. Yep. And then we have JPSS-2, we're, we're so excited to see in orbit. Okay, so talk a little bit about what JPSS-2 and its predecessors actually provide for us from a data standpoint. Well, the first thing that's most obvious to anybody who's looking at the data is the visible imagery. So you mm -hmm. can see forest fires, uh, flooding, severe storms such as hurricanes. And then we have something called sounders, two specific sounders, one that's called a microwave uh, sounder that can basically look through clouds and look at storm structure. It's kind of like looking at a, a MRI of a storm. <laughs> and then there's a, a something called a CRIS or a cross-track infrared sounder. Together, these two things give us a very fine perspective of the vertical um, uh, resolution of temperature and humidity all around the world. That's, it's very impressive. And, and one of the things that impresses me all the more is that you guys have worked in partnership with NASA to develop these. So tell me a little bit about that partnership. Yes, and NASA's been around since, of course, 1959. And, and in 1960, NASA launched the first weather satellite called Tyros-1. Mm. And so we are actually a direct descendant of Tyros-1. Nice. And so um, we started, NOAA became, became an agency in 1970, and we've been working with NASA ever since. Well, now it's it's amazing. Number one, that you could be part of this this long legacy, but yeah. but here we are. We're on the brink of rolling back for JPSS two and then launching. Obviously, once it flies um, and separates and goes through all its uh, procedures and everything, it starts to provide this data. Talk about your relationship with the meteorologists that get this data. It's got to feel pretty special. It is special. When I first started working uh, in, in this business, I worked on satellites that weren't as obvious to everyday <laughs> users. And so I love the fact that a lot of people, the first thing they do when they get up in the morning is get some coffee, look at the weather, right? Fair point. And so almost everyone that's looking at their phone is utilizing data from our satellites. And so it's really rewarding to see not only how everybody can use a satellite, but how uh, when we talk to the scientific community, they're so excited about the extra data that we're getting from this. And this extra data will go into numerical weather prediction models, which will give us better three to seven day forecasts. Which, I mean, I don't know about you, but even yeah. the most uh, average everyday person can appreciate more information when it comes to weather prediction, that's for sure. Weather is a difficult <laughs> industry to be in because you get a lot of criticism, but I do love to see how over the last 20 years, we've improved those weather forecasts as compared to truth measured on the ground. And it's been, and, and I can see the, the, the accuracy getting better year to year. Awesome, we yeah. love that. Well, Tim, yeah. thanks for being on the show. And thanks so much yeah. for having and me, Blair. We look forward to great success with JPSS too. So do I, thank you. Franklin had a chance to sit down with AJ Coleman to talk more about JPSS too. I'm here with AJ Coleman, who is the JPSS project lead. How you doing, AJ? Doing great, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. So JPSS two. Uh, this is the uh, second in the line of the JPSS satellites. Mm -hmm. It's launching five years after JPSS-1. Are these satellites identical? If not, what's the difference? So they are very closely related. The instrument suites are nearly the same. The primary difference is being, one, it's built on a different bus. So we have a different company actually making the, the thing that we attach the instruments to and we have a slightly different instrument profile. We no longer have series, which measured the Earth's radiant energy, and we've added in a limb profiler to our ozone monitoring instrument. So as well as looking down, which we call a nadir view towards the Earth, it can also look back and see that nice little sliver of atmosphere between space and the Earth uh, to measure ozone there as well. Well, you just mentioned two of the instruments. Can you name 
was it, four instruments on JPSS2? Four instruments on JPSS2. The VIRS, which is a visible infrared radiometer. That's the nice one. We call that the money maker. It takes pretty pictures as well as other actual scientific data. There is CRIS, which is a cross-track infrared scanner, which means as we go over the Earth, it's measuring this way. So it, it kind of sweeps back and forth as we travel. There is ATMS, which is a microwave sounder, which also works the same way. And then we have OMPS, which I mentioned before, which is a ozone monitoring instrument. How do these instruments enhance the collection of data for this continuous data record? The data that NOAA collects has been evolving and improving since 1960 when they launched the first TIRO satellite. The instruments that we have now actually started with MPP, which is the satellite that came before J1 that's very closely related to it. Because we have uh, built several versions of these instruments, and by versions, I mean, they're, they're very much the same. Slight improvements, you know, updated pieces of hardware in them from time to time, but very much the same instruments. You will have a continuous data record from NPP launch through J1. J1 and NPP are still working. We're launching J2. J3 comes in 2027. J4 comes in 2032. And we expect these satellites to last a very long time. So even though the mission life expectancy is seven years, uh, it would not be uncommon to get 10, 15, 20 years out of these satellites where our scientists could compare apples for apples, science data over a 30 or 40 year period. JPSS-2 is not your uh, first rodeo when it comes to the JPSS satellites. That is correct. <laughs> what is your work gonna be with uh, JPSS-3 and beyond? As, as a me, um, I will probably maintain a role of engineering oversight. Um, I don't do much uh, wrench turning anymore. Uh, I try to stay off of the keyboards. You know, I, you know, I don't want to get too loose and you know, code something they don't like. But uh, really what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is really supporting the engineers and our NASA NOAA customers, uh, making sure they have the right training, guiding them through some tougher technical uh, issues. I have about 14 years of satellite operations experience. I've done two launches now. This will this will be the third one I've participated in. So really just helping groom a lot of the younger employees and making sure we're meeting customer requirements and really helping out NASA and NOAA and keeping that relationship strong. Joining us now is Jordan Girth of NOAA's National Weather Service. Jordan, thanks for being on the show. Glad to be here. You know, we've heard a lot about the instruments for JPSS2 and all the work that it's doing. As a meteorologist, you just have to be excited about all the data that you guys get. Absolutely. The imagery and the data that we get from the Joint Polar Satellite System is absolutely incredible. Uh, not only is it global, but the resolution of the imagery, the spatial resolution over the contiguous United States helps us to, to determine things like burn scars, flood extent, and also the severity of weather systems. Yeah, and, and that's really important because, you know, those are real world issues and things we have to deal with. So, and not just being pretty pictures, but real actionable data. Uh, how has this helped you and meteorologists uh, help people prepare for bad weather? The JPSS system, and we already have one of the satellites in the series up there now, JPSS-1, launched a few years ago. Those satellites are the most significant input that we have to these sophisticated numerical weather prediction models. Those numerical weather prediction models are really what help meteorologists build forecasts that are accurate at the three to seven and increasingly to the 10 day range. So with that global weather prediction, with that global weather observation, we're able to build a nice three to seven day weather prediction. Now we've just had a big significant storm in Hurricane Ian. Uh, was JPSS involved in uh, helping make determinations about what we should do as the hurricane approached? Our National Hurricane Center meteorologists use a lot of satellite data because there's very few other types of observations over the ocean. We have a few buoys and we rely on ship reports from mariners. Those are important to us. 
But to get a sense of the storm expanse and the storm structure, that's where these satellites come into play. And JPSS in particular, there's a couple things that we saw in the JPSS-1 data to really help us understand that storm, one of which from the Advanced Technology Microwave Sounder gave us a really clear indication of the eye wall, a very strong signature uh, that indicated the intensity of that storm. Now, how does that compare to previous uh, storms where you didn't have that data? Well, if you dial back the clock far enough, we didn't have any satellite data, and of course, Fair. that was really, really difficult to deal with, right? There was a lot of chaos in coastal areas with that uncertainty of not knowing. Maybe you heard from a faraway ship that there was something out there, but where was it going? Was it headed toward the U.S. landfall or not? So with as we've gotten progressively better satellite observations, we've been able to resolve these storms more precisely. So we get higher resolution, and the JPSS series is multiple satellites. So we can make sure that we're always going to see that, that storm system several times per day as it makes its way toward land. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm very thankful that uh, you guys are doing the work that you're doing, preparing people for storms and analyzing and using that data well. Jordan, thanks for being on the show. Glad to be here. Go JPSS too. Awesome. Now we're going to take another look at this tremendous 100th mission for LSP. of the Falcon 9 and DART on NASA's first planetary defense test to intentionally crash into an asteroid. In my time during LSP, the most significant demonstration of technology that I've seen has to be the DART mission, the double asteroid redirect test mission. Essentially, we launched a spacecraft. It traveled over six million miles to an asteroid and it crashed into it. This was mankind's first attempt to prove that we're smarter than the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs had a horrible space program. They had no way to protect themselves against an asteroid coming in to wipe them out. First of all, that's the type of stuff you see in a movie. So just starting from that, I think that's really unique and really cool that it's not actually a movie. We're doing this in real life. Like we do this for work. My favorite mission, even though that's a difficult question to answer, has to be the MER missions, the Mars Exploration Rovers, that's Spirit and Opportunity. We launched those in 2003. That happened to be a mission that I worked from beginning to end as a mission manager. I got to meet really exciting people. I got to meet the scientists involved. I still have friends that I made back then from JPL and headquarters. And overall, I think it's the one that always stays in the back of my mind as my favorite mission. So I think I would pick the New Star mission. It was launched out of Kwajalein. I had never been in that part of the world before. And by the time you get there and you're set up, with the whole team, you're very consolidated and you're very slimmed down to just the absolute necessary functions to support the mission. Didn't have the connection back to the mainland that you would normally have, and so you all had to get together and work all the problems together. You had no cars, you had to ride bicycles. So there were all kinds of, not just the challenges with the mission, but challenges with the living environment and what you had to do. So that one is pretty memorable to me. We're live here at Slick 3 at Vandenberg Space Force Base, and I'm joined today by Mick Waltman from LSP, friend of the show. How you doing, Mick? I'm doing great, Franklin. Glad to be out here for this mission. Looking forward to this. Absolutely, Mick. Now, behind us is the uh, MST, the uh, Mobile Service Tower, and behind it is the Atlas V in the 401 configuration. Can you give us an update as to uh, how things are going on this evening? Yeah, absolutely. The team has been on console for a couple hours now. They got the vehicle powered up, uh, testing things out, getting ready, checking out ground systems. Um, they have uh, run into a small issue on the ground system with a leak that they've noticed. So they're doing some troubleshooting right now on those ground systems, uh, getting, making sure everything's ready to go for the J2 launch later this morning. Uh, and uh, that's pretty normal for the team. They've got some built-in holds in the countdown, so everything's still moving forward on schedule, just working through those uh, ground issues before they get ready to move the MST. Okay, so for, for those uh, of our viewers who, you know, maybe haven't been on uh, watch any of our shows, here we have a rollback. The tower is going to roll back to expose the Atlas V. Now, back in the Cape on the East Coast, we have a rollout where the uh, launch vehicle leaves the uh, vertical 
integration facility. The, the VIF. VIF. Yep. Yes. And um, that's the difference in these, these two procedures. Yeah, here it's uh, Space Launch Complex 3. It's got a long history here, starting back in uh, 19, December of 99 when they launched uh, AC-141 from here, which was the first modification after the early ICBM missiles that were launched here, Atlas missiles. So ES Terra launched here. That was first one. Uh, LSP was actually part of that mission. Uh, and then today we've got the J-2 Atlas V uh, launching here. So this pad was always built with a mobile service tower that rolls back about 300 feet and it moves the whole tower. As you said, the clean pad concept that ULA has in Florida, they do all their integration and work in a vertical integration facility and then they roll the vehicle to the pad and that allows them to get uh, more work done, uh, clean pad as far as keeping the pad uh, just operational from that, from that aspect. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Atlas V and the 401 and some uh, history that's taken so place. So yeah, I, I mentioned uh, AC-141 in December of 99. That was the first mission for us LSP off of Slick 3 here. J-2 will be our last uh, Atlas V from Vandenberg Space Force Base. It is the 41st Atlas V uh, for United Launch Alliance in the 401 configuration, which has been a workhorse uh, for United Launch Alliance and NASA LSP. This is NASA's 100th mission. So LSP is very proud to be bookending the history here at Space Launch Complex 3 with our commercial partner, United Launch Alliance. They've been a, a huge help to us over the years getting our scientific missions on orbit. And we're just so happy to have J-2 and the Lofted mission uh, launching here today from this historic pad. Now, this uh, Atlas V that's taken off, it it's, doesn't have any solids on it. Yeah, that's the 401 configuration. Zero solids, because the performance we have here to get into polar orbit for J-2 and then lofted later on, uh, we have a lot of performance out of this vehicle from the uh, west coast here. Now, we were talking about it a little bit earlier. Uh, we're trying to position J-2 in orbit near J-1. It's almost like park putting it in a parking space. Yeah, so right now, as you heard earlier, uh, we have J-1 that's up there now, and then a, another satellite, NPP. Uh, and as we get ready to launch J-2 tonight, we're gonna put it in a specific spot, about 180 degrees out from J-1 in this uh, sun-synchronous polar orbit that, that they're in. Uh, going over the poles, north and south, you know, every 14 days, taking pictures of the Earth as it spins. So it is very, uh, it's needed to be able to get it into that parking spot, like you said, mm -hmm. and that's why we're using the 401. Due to reliability and the accuracy that they've had over the years, uh, we're gonna launch that rocket tonight and put J-2 exactly where it needs to be. And the follow-on missions, uh, J-3, will be positioned in the same way. Yeah, absolutely. J-3, J-4 that Noah's working on, eventually when we get ready to launch those they will put those in a similar orbit in different spots so that NOAA then can look at Earth from different uh, spots in the same polar orbit using all the satellites uh, that they have up there allowing them to get better data uh, better uh, capabilities to look at weather hey Mick well that sounds great uh, you know what Roll, uh, roll out is uh, forthcoming. Forthcoming, yeah. Roll, roll back. Roll back, yeah, roll not back. roll out. Roll no, back. We're roll back. Move back the MST. Absolutely. Uh, so you all just make sure you stay uh, tuned uh, into NASA Edge and NASA TV, who has the broadcast coming up uh, later on this evening into the morning. But right now, we are going to go to a word from our sponsor, LSP. Are orbital insertion challenges keeping you up at night? Has your spacecraft experienced rapid mass or weight gain? Have changing mission requirements caused anxiety about scheduling and cost? There is a simple solution. Try LSP. LSP is NASA's all natural, 100% organic answer to those struggling with the chronic symptoms of mission planning. Once you start using LSP, the discomfort of mission management should subside. It is not uncommon to see immediate results such as mission mass stabilization, appropriate load analysis, launch vehicle identification, and a reduction in manifest phobia. LSP is safe for all scientists and engineers. However, please consult with your physician before using LSP, as mission success can be followed by extreme professional euphoria and promotion. Start using LSP today and enjoy healthy mission success. Do not use LSP if you desire proper launch vehicle selection, integration, load analysis, or successful launch and deployment of your spacecraft. 
Personally, I've used LSP for years and I've suffered no side effects, only benefits. But please check with your doctor. And joining us now is Joe Del Corso of Lofted. Joe, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Well, I tell you, we're really excited. I mean, JPSS2 is an important mission, but this very special mission of Lofted, this technology demonstration, is also extremely important for NASA. Tell us about your role with Lofted uh, and, and what it does. Well, uh, so like you said, uh, I've been with Lofted for a very long time. I am the project manager for it. Uh, Lofted is the low Earth orbit flight test of an inflatable decelerator. What this is, it's a technology demonstration of a specific technology called HIAD, the Hypersonic Inflatable Aerodynamic Decelerator. So uh, it's, this is a technology that's been in development for uh, almost 20 years at this point. Wow. Now, you've tested HIADs before, but this is the first full-scale test of Lofted? That's correct. So what we've done in the past is we've tested uh, three-meter articles, sending them straight up into space, bringing them straight back down. The difference between that and what we're doing now is we're going to send our article into orbit. So there's much higher energy, and it's, it's a much uh, more um, it, it, it's a test that really actually shows that that this technology is mature to the point where it can be used for mission and fusion for NASA and for commercial applications. I want to talk about those commercial applications, but first, I'm just the materials. Some of the things I've seen, this, this shell on the outside, I mean, how did you guys come up with that? Uh, a lot of years of trial and error and working with um, subject matter experts who are just phenomenal in their field. So the outer uh, fabric itself, uh, we use silicon carbide. Uh, we found out that we could use SIC, Nextel, and a lot of other fabrics, along with uh, a whole series of different insulators. We got the original concept from the aft skirt of the Delta IV, which would take plume impingement. Mm, interesting. So you actually built on previous work and, and turned it into this cool tech demo. Absolutely. Now, I understand you'll come from orbit and you'll actually go through the deceleration process. How will the rest of the mission play out? Because I understand everything's going to happen fairly quickly after launch. That's correct. So the mission itself, we launch out of Vandenberg on an Atlas V. Uh, once we get up to orbit, the primary mission, JPSS-2, will be um, put on orbit. And then next stage will be the Centaur second stage doing a deorbit burn to set up lofted for re-entry. We will basically um, set up for re-entry uh, as we come over the pole and then enter uh, right and, and decelerate and uh, splash down right off the coast of Hawaii, about 500 miles. And, and that's happening uh, pretty soon after, after launch. That's correct. It'll be about two hours after launch. Yeah. So, so you got to be excited. This is, <laughs> is going to be incredible. It, it's been a long road getting uh, from, from initial concept to this point and uh, years and years of development and trial and error with materials and structure systems. And we've had an absolutely phenomenal, both commercial uh, group of folks working with us and a dedicated team at NASA. Now, it's interesting you mentioned commercial uh, interest. Uh, talk a little bit about that because, uh, you know, if this works, seems like a lot of people might be interested. We've, we've had a lot of folks approaching us, especially recently. Uh, ULA approached us a couple of years ago with the original concept, and uh, they're our partners on this particular mission. Uh, their plan is to utilize the HIA technology for a uh, system called Smart Reuse. They want to be able to bring back their thruster cluster, and um, that'll bring down the cost of access to space. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that, we've had interest from Outpost and a couple of other commercial entities who'd like to be able to re-enter heavy payloads to Earth. I tell you, this is all very exciting, Joe. We're very excited. We want to see the, is it a splashdown? I mean, do you call it the splashdown? It's a splash, right. yes. <laughs> when that happens and you guys are successful, where are you going to be uh, waiting for the data? Uh, I'll be here at Vandenberg in the control room, uh, pretty much going crazy once I see the data coming in. Oh, we love that. We'll look for you going crazy. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. All right, we're going to look again at the NASA LSP 100th Mission Celebration, and then we're going to hear from Kristen Damadeo from NASA Langley Research Center as she learns more about Lofted from Angie Emmett, Senior Project Engineer. Three, two, status check to proceed with terminal. Tim Dudley is go, and you are ready to go. Keep us 
It's been said many times, I'm not the first, won't be the last, but we really consider LSP to be a family. And by being kind of small and flexible and agile, we really have grown incredibly tight over the uh, now 24 years that we've been a program. Working with LSP is working with family. It's not even like family, it is family. And there's a lot of stress in the jobs that we have. We are trying to make sure that a spacecraft gets launched successfully where it needs to go for people who have worked on it you know, their whole lifetimes. And so that's a lot of pressure on the people in the organization. And so when you accomplish that launch, you know, you've done it together as a team. And so we all come together like a family to solve the problems and to get the mission done. And we're all working to achieve the same goal. The one thing I love about it is we make each other better. It's not just about the launch day, but the little things that we do all day every day that make the workplace enjoyable. I actually got hired on during the pandemic. And even though I was not meeting people like I normally would, I got to experience that family atmosphere, even virtually. And so I think it's something that really, it's, it's woven throughout the fabric of the program. And so there's a culture within LSP where people don't have to look behind their back, afraid that someone's gonna step on their back to get to where they wanna go, but instead, there are people who have your back and are pushing you forward so that you can be successful and so the program can be successful. And so that's where that family atmosphere comes from. It's talked about, but it's not just a saying, it's, it's a lifestyle. And so it's really cool to be a part of that. Come on down to Madman Allen's Used Rocket Emporium for all your rocket needs. I'm Madman Allen, and I'm mad, mad for used rocket engines. We got vintage rockets. We've got two-stagers. We've got boosters. Check out our inviting selection of Pegasuses. Buy two and we'll throw in the plane absolutely free. We've got Atlas Vs, we've got Vulcans, we've got Falcons. You like them heavy, we got them too. Look at this beaut. I've got so many rockets, we're giving them away. Forget the Alphas, we've got Deltas. Need a lightly used engine? Madman's gonna set you straight. We've got Minotaurs, we've got Falcons. Did I say Falcons? Bring that old bucket of bolts down to Madman Allen's used rocket emporium and we'll put you in the launch vehicle of your dreams. Take exit five off I-95 and drive that sucker all the way down to the coast, then turn around, head back about two miles to the Gulf Coast rest stop. We'll be by the picnic tables. Drive in with the car, blast off to a star. Like my mama used to say, science is fun if you own a rocket. Hi, Angie, thank you so much for joining us today. We're getting so excited for the lofted launch. Can you tell us a little bit about, as a mechanical engineer, what is your role with Lofted? Oh, mechanical engineer is a great role on Lofted because we get to be a part of the vehicle from the design phase. We get to be there when they machine the parts, when they fabricate the parts. We get to be there for the assembly, for the integration, and for the testing, all the way cradle to grave from design to launch. So this is a follow-on test to several other iterations of an inflatable decelerator that have flown before. What is different about this test, this spacecraft? What kind of challenges did you face in building this? Yes, it is different. So there's a couple of uh, areas that it is different. So this time we are actually going up and we're going to orbit the Earth and come back down. So that brings a challenge of recovering. We are going to splash down off the coast of Hawaii in the ocean. So we have to be able to get to the splashdown site. We have to recover the vehicle. At least we'd like to recover the vehicle. Get it out of the water. It's going to be waterlogged. It's going to be holding some water. Get a boat with a crane. Get it off of there. Also, another big challenge is just the size. It's a bigger vehicle. It's the six meter diameter aero shell. When it's inflated, it's very rigid. And when it's deflated, it's soft goods, so it's floppy. The heat shield is a silicon carbide, so you have to wear protection when you touch it. Yet it's really delicate, so you have the way you handle it, um, it's 400 pounds of just floppy material that you need to handle. So that's another challenge as well. 
Sounds like it was a lot of work to figure out how to pack it into the canister that it's going to be launched in. Yes, they had lots of practice and did lots of testing to ensure that they could pack it within its volume. We also brought that equipment to pack it here to Langley because we did have a test where we deployed it in a vacuum. So once it was deployed, we needed to pack it back again. So we had all of the machinery to do that here. So Lofted is going to be packed, but it's also going to be packed into the ULA rocket with another payload. What did you have to do to overcome any challenges with regards to being a rideshare? So we did work very closely with our partners. Uh, we needed to ensure that we fit within the required volume and that we were uh, that we had the mechanism to attach and separate from that rocket. Now, being with another payload, we had to adhere to their schedule because if we're not ready when they launch, then we lose our ride. So we want to ensure that we definitely maintain schedule, that we're cognizant of that, and we're also cognizant of the materials that we use because we don't want to contaminate their payload. So Angie, you mentioned that Lofted is going to splash down in the Pacific Ocean. Did you have to do anything specific or anything different with the spacecraft so that you'd be able to find it? Oh yes, yes. We have several items on this uh, vehicle to make sure that we can find it because it is going to be in the middle of the ocean and of course we want to recover it. It'll be dark, right? Depending on how long it takes for the boat to reach the instrument, it could be daytime, it could be nighttime. Uh, if it's nighttime, there, so we have a couple of different features. If it's nighttime, we have some flashing lights, some kind of aircraft lights. We also have these mirrors that will reflect light back at you from any angle. So any angle that you shine a light on it, it would reflect right back to you. We also have some uh, beacons that will uh, transmit its GPS location too. So we have a number of different ways to be able to find it. And I heard that there is a new component on this one, um, like a redundant data system. Yes, so we're going to have uh, two very similar uh, data modules and one is going to stay with the vehicle that we'll be able to recover with the vehicle, but the other one will actually be ejected uh, before a splashdown and it will be able to float also and it will also independently be sending its GPS coordinates. So we have the ability to find that ejectable data recorder and then also have the internal data recorder in the vehicle. What are you excited to see? What to you, what will make this mission a success? Well, of course, all data that we get is great data. We love data. If it comes from the real-time beacon that's going to be transmitting data through the experiment, if it's capturing data from the ejectable data recorder. But what I'm really excited to see is when we recover the vehicle, actually being able to see the physical aeroshell and seeing how the vehicle looks after re-entry. I think that's gonna be really exciting. Very cool. Well, that's really great and very exciting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Joining us now is Stephen Tobin, who's the lead thermal engineer for Lofted. Stephen, Lofted deploys a flexible thermal protection system. I imagine that has to be challenging to d develop a protection system that's flexible. Can you tell us about the challenges involved in this project? Uh, yeah, so the flexible thermal protection system is made of these layers of flexible blankets and we have to build them so that they're thick enough to protect the underlying inflatable structure from all of the aerodynamic forces and aerodynamic heating during hypersonic re-entry. But they have to be thin enough so that they can be flexible for folding and packing and strong enough so that they can handle all of the loads associated with deployment and the aerodynamic forces of reentry as well. You said blankets. Can blankets really be solid enough to, to actually help the payload as it enters our atmosphere or another atmosphere? Yeah. Well, the thing about uh, an inflatable decelerator is they can deploy to very large sizes, much larger than traditional heat shields, aeroshells. And so with that, it can actually decelerate higher in the atmosphere where the air is less dense. So it actually doesn't take as much heating as your traditional rigid capsules would where they decelerate much lower. So the requirement for max heating and total heat load is actually less than what your traditional heat shields are. 
And I, and I guess that flexibility uh, gives you a lot of advantages with regard to mass and size, which is very important depending on the types of things you're taking to another surface. Yeah, we're able to uh, carry a lot more mass with a you know, larger heat shield decelerating higher in the atmosphere. Talk about the process of actually uh, taking this heat shield and packing it uh, for deployment because you want to maintain the integrity. What are the things that you're looking for when you condense this down to make sure that it's still safe when it deploys in the atmosphere? So yeah, it has to be able to condense down to a very compact state without abrasion of mainly the outer surface, outer fabric that's going to be protecting the heat shield from aerodynamic forces and direct heating, but also the inner insulators, particularly around the shoulder area, which have a high bend radius, are going to be very vulnerable to abrasion during that packing process. So on our engineering design unit, it went through three packs and deployment, and then we completely you know, deconstructed it to make sure that we had no substantial damage to the outer fabric or the insulators on the inside. Now I'm wondering, when you have it deployed and it's actually being tested, how do you measure its effectiveness uh, thinking about the flexibility? Normally we put some sensors in there, but with this flexible system, how are you going to get this kind of important EDL data to determine whether Lofted is a success? So we actually route um, thermocouple wires at various uh, body point locations from the nose all the way outboard to the shoulder of the heat shield so that we can get a total in-depth profile of the you know, thermal response during flight. When Lofted completes this tech demo and splashes down, your work continues because you'll want to look at all that data. Yes, yeah, it's called post-flight reconstruction and um, we're going to be correlating our thermal models to the flight data to, to both validate them and improve them so that we can have a, a solid foundation for uh, design of these inflatables for future missions. Yeah, so that's really how Lofted is going to help us. Joining us now is Caleb Weiss of the United Launch Alliance. Caleb, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. And we've listened to a lot of people talk about the importance of the data for Lofted for NASA, but I understand ULA has a very keen interest on this data as well. Can you tell us a little bit about ULA's uh, interest in Lofted? Of course. Uh, well, first of all, it's a joint experiment between ULA and NASA. So the mission itself is just exciting for us and so happy to be partnering on it. Um, but the data itself is really going to help inform us on our engine reuse program. We are looking at using the HIAD technology to um, provide a, a decelerator to our Vulcan engines, bring them back and be able to reuse them multiple times. And as far as I know, there's nothing else like this being used used anywhere currently. It, there really isn't. It's it's very new technology. Um, there have been test flights of HIADs before, but Lofted is really going to be the first time where we're flying a big six meter HIAD, um, capable of bringing a significant mass down behind it. We're looking at an even larger HIAD for our reuse program. So we are looking at separating the aft end of our booster, bringing the engines back. The great thing about a HIAD is it's inflatable. So when it lands in the ocean, it doubles as a raft. And so we can, um, we we can get the most valuable parts of the booster back just by using a decelerator like the one flying on Lofted. Now, I know I might be speaking a little bit prematurely at this point, but I know you guys are working on a new rocket, uh, the Vulcan. Yep. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Vulcan and whether it has the potential for reuse? Absolutely, yeah. Vulcan has always been designed from the beginning for having reuse provisions, and it's really exciting time to be in launch vehicle development right now because we are really starting to move forward on even more reuse designs, starting with the most valuable parts first. So that's why we're we're first looking at recovering the engines. And you know, when you when you go to build reusability into your vehicle, there's lots of ways you can do it. Um, you know, we you can add additional fuel and do engine burns to to bring things back. The the, the key is with any reuse program, you've just put all this energy into the vehicle to try to get it to space, and now you have to pull all that back out. The thing we love about the HIAD 
is that it uses atmospheric drag to bleed off that energy. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to carry extra fuel. We don't, we're not taking any performance away from the payload in, in, in using fuel for coming back. We are simply deploying a large drag device <laughs> that then allows us to slow down as we come back through the atmosphere. We'll deploy a parachute for the last section of the descent, and then we'll land in the ocean and pick it up with a boat. It's very exciting to be actually part of this tech demo, especially considering how it may be a feature in a ULA rocket in the future. Pretty awesome. It now, is. I'm also wondering, um, you know, ULA obviously important for the engineering and science of a launch vehicle, but uh, this mission is dedicated to a ULA employee, uh, Bernard Cutter. Could you tell us a little bit about him? Yeah, it, um, I got to work a lot with Bernard. He was um, he was such a visionary. And I mean, he could look 10, 20 years down the road and see technology like this that was just going to change space. You know, something like a HIAD allows you to bring something back from space, which we don't do very much right now, unless it's a crew or cargo capsule. Most of what's up there stays up there. And, you know, he had that vision to look out at this kind of technology and know that this was going to have value across the industry and I think what was so special about him though is not just that he could he, he just dream things up but also implement them I mean lofted is here flying today you know it's it's a real thing and and that takes um, that takes a lot of effort you know day in and day out to you know form the partnerships line up the funding develop the materials everything that goes into actually bringing a new technology to market Bernard could do that and that's why we're we're, we're seeing lofted today and um, he would he would be absolutely elated to be seeing this fly he worked so hard on it and um, you know, we, we miss him every day, and, and especially on days like this, where something that, that he's had played such a big part in is, is ready to go to space. Mateo, we're really impressed with this and excited about this and hope it has great success. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thank you. We're gonna now look at another one of the 100th mission legacy moments for LSP. It never gets old. Three, two, status check to proceed with Toronto oh, Town. LD is go and Rock the one reached out. Three, two, one, zero. Liftoff of the mighty Delta IV heavy rocket with NASA's Parker Solar Probe. A rocket launch is anything but boring. I mean, it's exciting. No matter how many times I've seen it, it never gets old. When you talk about launch, it never gets old. Right? Each mission that we work is different. Each day that we are supporting these missions is different. So it never gets old. And the lift off. There's something about witnessing just the sheer impressiveness, just the power of what it takes to pull a spacecraft out of the gravity well of Earth that we live in and to send it out of Earth's orbit on its way to the moon, Mars, the sun, asteroids, even out of our solar system. I'll never tire of watching that. It never gets old. It really never gets old. Seeing rocket launches never gets old. It never gets old. You always are thinking about what's the next one? What's the next one I can do? This was my childhood dream. This is what I dreamed of doing. And you get to be a part of something that's so much bigger than yourself. And to me, that was the best thing that my childhood self could ever ask for. <laughs> The 100th launch for NASA's Launch Services Program began with a textbook tower rollback at Space Launch Complex 3 of United Launch Alliance's Atlas V, carrying both the primary mission, JPSS-2 satellite, and NASA's technology demonstration mission, Lofted. The 100th launch was spectacular, but for both missions, it is only the beginning of a series of milestones early in flight. After the successful separation of the JPSS-2 satellite, we saw the dramatic technology demonstration of Lofted. After inflating and separating, the low orbit in-flight test of an inflatable decelerator began its quick and safe return to the planet Earth. Everything went according to expectation and Lofted performed beautifully. This six meter diameter aeroshell may look slow at separation, but it will reach speeds of over 18,000 miles per hour before splashdown. An 
and the return was brilliantly captured in infrared by the NASA team on the recovery ship in the Pacific Ocean. Happy 100th to LSP, and congratulations to JPSS2 and Loftic for mission success. You're watching NASA Edge.